This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're coming off a big week for the Flames, and Matt, I don't think either of us can complain we got our predictions wrong. It's a five-game win streak now for Calgary. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. How you doing, buddy? Well, it's a disappointing week. You know, they only trounced one team. (laughs) You know, disappointments all around. You know, you won three games, but you only played exceptional in one. You know, we were disappointed after that Boston game on the third, and ever since then, they haven't looked back. I mean, you're right, only one trouncing there, but probably only one team that deserved to be trounced as well. True enough. The interesting thing about this team, and I mean, even Coach Peters has said his team wasn't looking as good as he wanted them to over the last little bit, but... This team has not played exceptional hockey all week. And you look even going back to that Philly game, not great hockey. I mean, you know, arguably in the Colorado game or even the Florida game, team showed up for about half the game and that's it. So the fact that we're winning as many games as we are and not even playing well, that really tells you something about this team. Oh, like I think you even have to go back to about the middle of December even for when the Flames were actually on a roll. Uh, like after that uh when we played the blues right before christmas like i think that was we were kind of mediocre in that game and the dallas game prior to that and it, like it we were struggling for quite a bit so like it's one of those situations where the team's been kind of waffling but yet getting points just cuz they are clearly on a different tier talent-wise from everybody else. We heard that term a few years ago, the find-a-way Flames, the team that could always find a way to win, and I think it's appropriate this year, like you said, on a different level, but able to, even if they don't play a good game, sort of buckle down and get pucks in the net and come away with the win. Well, look at that Florida game from this week. They played horribly in the first period, and yet it's like, oh, okay, we're down to nothing. Who cares? Let's go and beat them. And they did. Well, let's go through those games this week. Uh, we last broadcast during the the Chicago game. We won't talk about that one. But if we go back to the Colorado game, I was there covering that for, for the show from the press box. And, you know, I was watching the game and wasn't, I don't know, it, it was a weird game. It got really boring near the middle because the Flames stopped trying after about halfway through. They let their foot off the gas for, I'd say, about 30 minutes. But, again, found a way to get it done. And... You know, Backlund, Jankowski, Lindholm, and Frolik, and Kachuk all scored to give the Flames the win in that one. Yeah, well, Calgary has, a, for the last while, has had a bad habit w- with the bad teams where they just look at them in the standings and go, boy, these guys suck, so we don't really have to try that hard. And, like, if we make a mistake or two here and there and allow a bad goal due to, a, like, a defensive breakdown... It's like, oh, okay, sure, and, you know, then we'll just go and score five goals and beat them. Like, it's, that's, I think, what led to Peters being so frustrated. Like, the Flames got up 2-0 in this game, and then they let their foot off the gas, let Colorado back in it, and then had to try it again. Like, it just a very inconsistent effort, and... The two goals that in the first period, I think, were Noah Hannafin just having a little bit of defensive lapses for the pretty much the first time this season. Yeah, he hasn't looked great this week. No. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, Backlund scored, Janko scored, and I was really looking at the team going, wow, they got a 2 nothing lead. This should be a pretty solid lead for these guys. Um, and then we see McKinnon and Johnson go and even it up. And... Uh, that Lindholm goal in the second, I think, was a lucky goal that he even scored on that one. But, you know, you'll take what you can get. And that ended up really, I think, becoming the turning point, even though Froelich was the game winner. I think it was that Lindholm goal where the team kind of started to get their acting gear and get back into this one. I agree. And, you know, 
I have to say Colorado is a fast team. That's the one thing I noticed watching them. Like I think not not so much like you were saying the crappy teams taking their foot off the gas, but I think the Flames maybe underestimate how quick that team was. Yeah, and it's a testament to how different this team is talent wise, because under normal circumstances, like that's probably a four two win for Colorado. It, but like this team just has enough talent where they're able to overcome playing very poorly for most of the game and yet still winning. And that is a mark of elite team. It's just that you can't keep doing that and expect to have success down the road. For sure, but it's also that point that, you know what, we can be, I don't want to say crummy, but we can maybe not play as well as we should be for a little while and still end up, you know, winning until we figure things out. And in the past, we would have probably seen the Flames have gone on probably a seven or eight game losing streak if they were playing like this. Yeah, like, frankly, like, after Christmas, like, if this was, like, the normal Flames from past years, we might have four wins out of all of the games that have been played, and that's being generous. I'm going to knock on wood here, but the Flames have only lost 13 this season. Like, they've yet to go on much of a losing streak at all, and let's hope that continues. Well, especially with the next handful of games this week and into next week, like, they're not really playing any overly talented teams so they should be able to win most if not all of them i'm thinking after nine days off though they might have a hard time getting it going again in february yeah true enough and then we'll talk about uh, the next two games your second favorite team the florida panthers came to town played the flames florida sort of the opposite of what we just talked about got up early mike hoffman and jonathan huberto scored um, to to get the the game going for Florida, and then the Flames answered back with four unanswered before Dadnov really put an insignificant goal in, insignificant goal in the net. But we saw Froelich get his eleventh, Giordano get his seventh, Kachuk get his twenty first, and Monahan get his twenty fourth to take the Flames to a four to three win. Yeah, this was a game where like for the first thirty minutes, really until the Froelich goal, the Flames weren't really involved in the game at all and it like they just it, it was frankly florida was playing a good game for the first half and calgary just didn't seem that interested but that one bounce happened with the puck going off for leaking in and it that just sparked the team and like they just put the foot on the pedal from that point forward yeah and i thought after that they played with pretty consistent pressure yeah, exactly. And, like, this team, even in games, like, they take their foot off the pedal, and, like, if they get down by two goals, they they don't really care, which is odd as in long of as, itself. As long as it's not getting down by two in the third. Yeah, and then they they just, oh, we'll get it back, and then, like, they get one bounce, and then, okay, time to go, let's go, and, uh, you know, let's put the foot on the pedal now, and... It's a weird team in that, like, they have the ability where they can actually do that. Because in sane normal hockey, like, that's your <laughs> nuts, basically. You know, like, you just can't play like that and expect to win games. And yet, in the last 10, the Flames are 8 1 and 1. So, at it's the same like, time, I'm kind of glad they're preserving their energy because we're going to need it for a long playoff stretch. Oh, true enough. And it also doesn't help that San Jose and Vegas, over their last 10 games, are also 8-1-1, which, like, you know, it's great that they've been winning games, but you'd think that they'd get some separation from those other two teams, but no. I could be wrong, too, but I think the fact that the Flames are maybe not playing at 100% um, might also be contributing to why we really haven't seen any major injuries this year. True enough. Like... You can even see with James Neal, like, he shows flashes that he's James Neal still. It's just that I think that his give-a-crap meter, like, especially after going to the finals two years in a row, like, the first half of the season, he's like, eh, do I really need to try that hard? And especially with the Flames winning so much. It's interesting you mentioned uh -uh. Neil, though. Like, I've been thinking about him over the last week. Any other team that had James Neal, if he was playing like this, the team would have been doomed. 
Like, oh, yeah, for sure. He's been such an integral part of those teams that you know this team is deep when James Neal can play the way he is, and they're still second in the league. Yeah. And we're starting to see, like, he's been putting up a couple of points here and there over the last handful of games. And I think, like, what you're going to end up seeing as we go down the stretch is that he'll actually start to be playing like James Neal and getting engaged in games where before we're winning, does his contribution really, really matter that much? Not really. So he can kind of coast a bit to... Because he has played like an extra half of a season of hockey over the last two years. So, you know, he's kind of burnt in and of himself. So, it, it him taking it a little easier, if it keeps him fresh for down the stretch and into the playoffs where he plays like James Neal during that stretch, then, the, hey, awesome. And, you know, everybody will forget about the first half of this year. I think it was you that said in the offseason, you know what, Neil's probably going to be a guy that we're glad to have around when it comes postseason. Yeah, and I had a feeling, especially because of how much hockey he's played, that he was going to struggle, especially due to the fact that for the first half of the season, like he's on a, a new team with new line mates, a new situation, and the team's doing so well that he hasn't really needed to be the guy where other places he has had to be one of the key contributors. So he's kind of been able to take it a little easier and contribute in other ways and rest up so that way when the games actually matter, he's ready to go. Well, you mentioned James Neal getting a point recently, and um, James Neal got a point in the next game. I think everybody got a point in the next game. This is Mark Giordano's 800, 800th NHL game, and he had two goals and an assist in that game. So a great showing for the guy who seems to be like a fine wine and gets better with age. We had Giordano, Monahan, Kachuk, Goudreau, Kachuk again, Giordano, and Bennett score in a 7-1 win over Arizona. And I think to be fair here, we look at the final score and go, the Flames played really well. I didn't think the Flames played all that well. I think that this was partly a lousy goaltender for um, in Aiden Hill for um, Arizona, but I think the Flames played well enough. They overpowered these guys, but I don't look at this and think, wow, what a great Flames performance. How about you? Uh, you know, I, I saw Goligoski for Arizona being, frankly, stupid out there. Like, Anders Ericsson level bad for, like, the entire game. And, like, the first four goals, the guy who scored was the guy he was supposed to be covering. So, you know, like, it just, you know, like, just really bad defense from Goligoski. And between that and the goal to, like... It, Frankly, like the, so many of the Flames' goals, like you just can't let the Flames players like just drive the net like that. And it, like three of the Flames' goals were goals that should not have happened if they were playing competent defense. And like I can't even play place all of the blame on Aiden Hill. I thought he actually played okay, not great, mind you, this but Coyotes okay. Team is missing a lot of their important players right now. Yeah, and it was basically the Flames were playing in a, a half an AHL team, and their defense was putrid at best. And, you know, any team that has offensive weapons like Calgary it, and goes up against a team that has that porous of defense, like, it, you're going to see a 7, 8, 9, 10 goal game. It's just, that is what it is. Like, the players know how to get into the right areas, and... If the, there's no one home, pucks are going in the net. And they play the other half of that AHL team this Saturday when they take on the Edmonton Oilers. Indeed. <laughs> but yeah, good game. I mean, as Flames fans, we need these, and you always need that you know blowout game to uh, to get your team looking good. I think you know it's probably what the Flames need after the the games that we've had and them not playing really well. Well, especially as the coaching staff and the, some of the players have said like they've been playing sloppy and they need to tighten things up. The fact that Mike Smith played very well, I thought, in this game. And frankly, if he let that first goal in uh, off that one really good chance on the power play for the Coyotes, it would have been one nothing for the Coyotes at that point, and it might have been a completely different game. I also don't, I think to be fair to Mike Smith, yeah, he played a good game, but I don't think he got tested all that much. No. But he did what he needed to do. The confidence-building game. 
Yeah, and for him, he needs that. Uh, especially, so like if in the next game he plays, if he does that again, maybe he might get on a roll. We'll see, but it helps. And this is just a game where the Flames are were just going up against a really lousy team. And there's not really too many positives that you can take from it other than they tightened up defensively, they didn't really allow anything, and they put the boots to the other team, which is what everything that they needed to do, they went and did. They're going to be playing some tougher opponents than Arizona this upcoming week, even though they're not very good teams. They have to be able to show some consistency, so that way they're limiting the opposition's chances like they did in the Arizona game. Yeah, I'm hoping this acts for the team to sort of get up and get excited by and ride this into the bye week. Yeah. Um, well, after that game, an interesting stat, the Flames have tied a franchise record, getting 30 wins in 47 games, and we tie with the 88-89 team. So long... Yeah, that was a rather insignificant year in the Flames' history. Long time ago, but it tells you, again, knock on wood, I don't want to you know predict anything or jinx us, but um, looks like we're trending the right way. Well, frankly, there's five teams in the Western Conference that have already made the playoffs for all intents and purposes. Nashville, Winnipeg, us, Vegas, and San Jose. So it'll just be interesting for the rest of the way to see if the Flames can keep ahead of those other two teams in the Pacific, and if so, then they'll have a very good chance of winning in the first round as they'll be playing one of the weaker teams and allow Vegas and San Jose to beat up each other. Well, let's take a look at those stats. So we know Tampa Bay is still the number one team in the league with 72 points now after 46 games. Calgary's played 47 games. They have 30 wins, 13 losses, four overtime losses for 64 total points. So they're eight points back. Like you said, San Jose and Vegas have kind of put their games together as of late. I thought San Jose would. Uh, San Jose's at 61 points and Vegas is at 60 points. So they're re- breathing right down our necks here. Um, we've all played pretty much the same number of games. Vegas played 48 and us in San Jose played 47. Right now, I'm not too worried about the Flames, but I think this is a good time for the Flames to say, you know what, hey guys, we can't you know, play, be playing sloppy. we got to go out there, we got to tighten this up, and we have to. I think so far they've had, they've had that gap where it hasn't mattered, and I think now they've got to tighten the gap. Yeah, well, like if you look at, it, like now it, or I guess it's... widen the gap. Yeah, well now it's vital for the Flames. Like, playoffs are pretty much guaranteed now that the Flames are 17 points up. Yeah, it's just a matter of where you are. Yeah, so now it's just a matter of figuring out what you're doing. And if the Flames are the division winner, they're going to be playing one of the wildcard teams, which, frankly, all of the guys that are from 6th to 12th or whatever, they all are all kind of mediocre. So if we it, look at that list, just if you don't mind me for a sec, yep. Dallas, Colorado, Minnesota, Anaheim, Vancouver, Edmonton. Yeah. It, throw Arizona in there because I think they're like two points back of that. So, like, they're all of those teams kind of suck in various ways. Like, Anaheim's decimated with both underperforming players and old players. Edmonton just sucks. Uh, Vancouver's has like three players that are good and then the rest are bad Uh, colorado's a one-line team dallas is a one-line team minnesota's just there so like none of those teams are overly dangerous and the flames can pretty much mop the floor with any of them if they're actually playing well or if the flames don't win the division then they have to play either vegas or san jose And that's going to be, you know, like you're playing one of the other top three or four teams in the NHL. That's going to be a real dogfight to get through. And then you're going to be beat up into the second round if you make it through and then have to play the other one. And like you're basically like even if you do get to the conference finals at that point, you're beat up and you're probably going to lose. So like this is the difference between the Flames having a very good chance of going all the way to the cup or getting bounced early. Yeah, even with a team like San Jose, I think we might have a difficulty with it. I think Vegas, in round one we could, but I think Vegas isn't deep enough that I'd be as worried about them in round two. No. 
Oh, no, and I think that we'd probably handle either in round two, especially if we're fresh and that they've been they've played like a seven game series. I think that the Flames would pretty much win probably in five or six. I'm kind of hoping we go up against Anaheim just because we've had so much trouble with them lately. You kind of got to, you know, defeat the boss and then move on to the next level. I'd rather not face Anaheim just because of all the stupidity of the Honda Center. Like, I don't want any thing getting in their heads. At the same time, though, we'd play the first two here. Like, we would have the majority of the home games on our on our rink. Oh, I know. Well, that happened in 0506, and that didn't really help, so... <laughs> it was a very different team, too. True enough. But, yeah, you're right. I think the, the big threats to us right now, as far as, you know, anything outside of the Western Finals, is San Jose Vegas. I mean, they're at 60 and 61 points. Nashville and Winnipeg, I think, will be a good series if Calgary gets there, but we don't need to worry about that right away. And then the next best team, I mean, Nashville's got 58 points, then we drop down to Dallas at 50. And I have this feeling that Dallas is going to fall. I don't think that they're going to be that high by the end. No. Frankly, I think that uh, Colorado, Minnesota take two of those spots, and I, I'm going to have to say Anaheim would be the third. Because... I I just I don't see them like they've lost eleven in a row and they're still very close to a playoff spot. I don't see them falling that far where they're like going to be permanently out. I think they're just going through a really bad stretch right now. And again, kudos to them for being able to go through that kind of stretch and still maintain a playoff spot. But you know that's an, that's a team that's getting old. Yeah. Well, hopefully the Flames will maintain this, but, I mean, it's been a few weeks now. You and I have been talking about the Flames being number one in the West, and that's not a luxury we usually enjoy on this show, talking about the Flames. Usually we're fighting for an no. eighth spot. Yeah, I know. It's like we're, we get to look at the league standings instead of the wild card or conference standings. There's a lot less math we have to do. Well, if these guys lose and these guys lose and somebody does voodoo on this guy and yeah, just win and you'll stay ahead of the other losers. So <laughs> well, and I and I think that's the thing too. I'm thinking for teams like San Jose and Vegas. I mean, they've been really inconsistent. They haven't come on till lately, and I'm not convinced they're going to stay that way. I think we might be seeing a flash in the pan from both these guys. I think yeah, like I don't expect Vegas like that. I ever since the Flames beat them like seven to one or whatever it was. Like they've been on a roll that's just been ridiculous. Like I think they've they're twenty one three and three or something like that. And like that's just not sustainable over the long term. And they'll fall back a bit, uh, whether it's a lot or not, is yet to be determined. But I don't see them maintaining anything like that for the longer term. No, and if you look at all three teams, Calgary, San Jose, and Vegas, they're all on an eight one and one streak in the last ten. Uh, San Jose's won their last six, Calgary's won their last five, Vegas their last one. So, you know, I, I think that I think Vegas is a team that if they want to stay in contention, they'll have to make a move of the deadline. I don't know they have enough to give up to do that. San Jose, I think, will make the playoffs, but I, I agree with you. I think they'll be number two. Yeah. I There's always been something about San Jose where, like, even though they've always been a really talented team, it's choke. like they... They just there's just something about the makeup of that team where you go, eh, they're beatable, and they, they get they lose. It, like even when they made it to the finals a couple years ago, it I you know as soon as they did, it's like oh well Pittsburgh's winning the cup, and sure enough, well because they, they handled... choke early, like you know it's always yeah. oh people predict they're gonna go to round three and they you know choke in round two and like it's just I don't know it's a team that reminds me of sort of the '90s uh, Canucks or Rangers when they just couldn't finish. Yeah, or like the late 90s, early 2000s St. Louis Blues where they they were just like perennially the conference winner and yet they'd lose in the first round, oddly enough, to San Jose frequently. And yeah, there's just something about the makeup of that team that just, they, it's not good. And it's kind of bizarre. See what happens. Well, some good news for the Flames, uh, besides their win streak, is Eric Francis talked to Michael Stone this past week. Uh, They were talking about it at at the Coyotes game, and Stone says that his blood clots are pretty much healed. He feels like he's ready to come back, and uh, he's meeting with doctors next week. So he could be back fairly soon. I don't want to say in the next week, but let's just say fairly soon. 
So, I mean, that's a big veteran defenseman coming back. He's a right-handed shot, but, Matt, I wanted to ask you, with a veteran guy like that coming back to the lineup, would you still be as inclined for the Flames to go shopping for a veteran left-handed defenseman, or do you think that brings sort of the veteran defenseman that they need? Frankly, like if you look at our left-side defenseman, you have Giordano, uh, then you have Hannafin, who's 21, and then Shillington, who's 22, and Valimaki, who's 8. 18 or 19 it's a little risky like on the right side you have brody who's 30 hannafin or hamannick i mean who's almost 30 and then you have anderson who's young and then stone and for me just because of the inexperience of hannafin i think the flames should get some sort of veteran on the defense but i wouldn't necessarily be going out and spending a ton on that guy but they, I think they need somebody just due to the fact that the three guys in the second and third and spare guy are all so young that you don't want to be forced into a situation where you're having to play a guy who's inexperienced, especially in a playoff situation where if you have a guy who's been around might be less prone to making dumb mistakes. Yeah, and I think that you could probably... I think that you'll probably see Stone at least for a little bit when he comes back. I wouldn't be surprised, first off, if they send him on a conditioning stint, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him jump right in the lineup, which means one of those kids is out. Um, and the question is who? I mean, Anderson is right now playing on the right side. I think Anderson has earned the right to be here, so that probably means Stone on the right. And what, Anderson, do you move Anderson to the left, or do you send him down and keep Shillington on the left? Well, I think that, yeah, it's one of those things. You might play Stone on an offside and throw him on the left just to get him some action, but I think what you you said about a conditioning stint would make sense and then figure it out after that. But I think that heading into the playoffs, you'd like your 7-8 and eight defensemen to be... Like, frankly, I'd start with either Shillington or Valimaki as the third pairing guy on the left side. But having a veteran guy where if in the playoffs the guy plays poorly or is exposed a little bit, you have that other guy who can slot in. And I don't think that Stone playing on his offside would go much better than Brody playing on the left side. So... I don't know. It's one of those like I'd rather hedge my bet if I'm if you're doing it properly and frankly a third pairing defense is not going to cost you an arm and a leg. You've also got the option of the guy I even forgot was a flame until I saw his name on the lineup sheet for the Colorado game, Dalton Prout. Who yeah. somehow is still here. Oh, well, he's all right. It's He's just played that... 7 games. It's tough not to look all right in 7 games. Yeah, like, I wouldn't want him out in a playoff game, put it that way. Well, like, at all. Yeah. Like, unless the Flames ran into, like, four injuries on their defense and you just need a body like Brennan Evans back in 04, <laughs> then that's fine, but, yeah, no. Well, I mean, if you look at the available bodies, he's probably the best one. We don't have much on the farm. We got, you know, Valiev, and um, that's about it. Yeah, I know. Not exactly it a lot of defensemen and that's why i think that the flames in the draft are going to be drafting a number of defensemen this year well i I don't i don't really think it matters as much what they draft as long as they keep their dang picks i'm fine if they actually use some of their picks to add this year it's just some of the low level ones but they got to keep number one they got to keep number two do they even have their number two pick this year uh i'd have to check um, what have they got? No, they don't. You're right. Uh, pick trade away. Let's see, to whom? That pick was traded as part of the Hamannick deal. It's a condition. So if the Flames miss the playoffs in 2018, the Islanders get their second round pick. If the Flames make the playoffs in 2018, they get their 2020 pick. Yeah. So that's going to that's gonna go to the Islanders. Yeah. But right now we have one, three... We don't have our fourth. We have the Islanders' fourth, our fifth, and no sixth. And we have the uh, Hurricane seventh. Yeah. But, yeah, I think, I mean, looking at a lot of areas, the Flames 
don't have much to deal that's not an NHL roster spot because their depth is so limited as it is on the farm that they don't have a lot to give up. And I'm not sure that giving up a future piece for a rental is really going to help us all that much if we do have Stoner coming back. Yeah. I think long term, though, well, not even long term, this summer there's going to be some hard questions asked about Stone because this team's going to have to free some cap room. And he's, I mean, if you've got Anderson and Shillington who are serviceable enough at a lot cheaper, I think it's going to make them take a good long look at Michael Stone. And the fact that we've done okay without him for how long now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, the Flames, uh, their four young defensemen are doing such an awesome job that it's fine. It's just that... And and even going to the playoffs, I mean, that last unit is looked at for how much? Like, eight minutes a night? I think they can probably do that in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, It just depends on what you're giving up. Like, if you're giving up a minor prospect for a depth defenseman, like, that's fine, but... Or a draft pick, one or the other. Like, it doesn't matter too much. It's just that I think they need to get somebody, but it's not, like, the most vital thing needed. Absolutely. But, you know, uh, and good to have, but not a necessary to have. And while we're looking at the lines, another interesting question I wanted to ask you. We've seen the second line. We'll call the second line like a Chuck Backlund line. We've seen that line rotate this year. I mean, we all thought it was blasphemous when Peters wanted to break them up after what we saw. And we've seen Bennett rotate in there. We've seen Neil rotate in there. I think we've seen Zarnik rotate in there. Um, But really, in the last couple games, he's reunited that 3M line. And they're looking as good as always. And I guess my question to you is... Do you keep playing with that line, or do you lock that 3M line in? To me, going into the playoffs, I want those guys together. I think you need that great shutdown line for a playoff series. But what do you think? If the Flames can get a legit second-line scoring winger at the deadline, then throw him in that spot. Like, uh, you know, and I've mentioned, like, Gustav Nyquist or somebody like that. Try that out, so that way you can spread the wealth around and maybe have Froelich playing down in the lineup. But if not, then Froelich should be on that line. Yeah, I mean, Bennett's been tried there. Bennett looked good, but to me, not as good as... You know, Froelich as a player maybe didn't look as good as Bennett, but just the chemistry among those three guys, it's better than the sum of its parts. Yeah, exactly. And Bennett makes Neil better, and I think that with Jankowski, that line fits better. It's one of those things that, like, if the Flames get a second-line right winger, then they can shift Froelich down to the fourth line to play with Ryan and whomever else. But if they keep Froelich on the second line, I think the Flames might need to go and get a decent fourth-line winger of some sort just to so that way the team can run four lines because I'm not sure that I'd like to have like either Manjapane or Dubé or whatever and Hathaway going opposite Neil like or Ryan I mean another like to add not necessary to if they fail to get a second line winger see even if they get a second line winger to me we know what we've got with that 3M line I would keep Goudreau Monaghan Lindholm as line one Kachuk Backlund for a league as line two and let's just say Nyquist for the sake of conversation Bennett Jankowski Nyquist as line three I think now you've got a really good mix of guys all up and down the lineup. You've got two potential scoring lines then with one and three. You've got a great shutdown line. And that would give you Zarnik, Ryan, Neal on line four, which is still a, a good NHL line. It depends on how Neal plays the rest of the way. Like, if he continues to struggle like he has, then, yeah, if him on the fourth line is not a bad idea, but... I think he's going to be picking it up. So it's one of those well, things. Even like, then, you could slide Bennett into the center position. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. Like, there's lots of different options, especially if the Flames do acquire a second line, second slash third line guy. I think Michael Froelich, I mean, you know, he's a good player. We talked about him last week. This is a guy who a lot of NHL teams would like to have in their lineup and would be probably a second-line guy. And I think really here he's looked better than he probably should have because that line has clicked so well. Yeah. And frankly, like, I think it it depends on what type of team you have. Like, if for leaks on the Oilers, for example, he's a second-line player. If he's on a good team, he's more likely a third-line player. And frankly, with how he's played this season – 
even with Calgary, he should be a third or fourth line guy. It's just that the Flames have so much depth that they can have him on the second line due to his chemistry, and, like, it's fine. Like, it's not the end of the world having a slightly lesser player up in the lineup. When, I think if Neil had picked things up, him and Froelich would have been swapped a long time ago. Yeah. For sure, I agree. But, yeah, I mean, you know, don't discredit what we're saying here is Froelich not being good, but... Yeah, definitely, it's something they need to watch. And I think, especially if we're going into a playoff spot not in first place and we're playing against San Jose or Vegas, I think the value of that shutdown line is going to be tremendous for the Flames. The I agree. Line. I agree. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see what the team does, but I'm glad to see they've reunited that line, and I, I really enjoy watching them play. It's unique to have a line like that, especially so high up. Yeah, so like, frankly, nights. the only line that I consider to be better than that at both ends of the ice is the uh, Pasternak, Marchand, uh, Bergeron line in Boston, and that's it. I'd encourage Flames fans to even take a look at this line in their ice time. You can see charts of where they played. There's a lot of times this team does not get any real play time in the offensive zone. Like they're started when we're in the off season or when we're in the uh, defensive zone or we're changing them in on the fly. Like there's times these guys are not getting much offensive time, but they're doing huge amounts of value for this team. Oh, for sure. They are the three best defensive forwards on the team. And I don't think Goudreau, Monaghan, and Lindholm could do their job as well if we Not didn't at all. have that second line to chase You know, some of the big guys on other teams. Oh, for sure, because teams have to worry about more than one thing on this team. And like Before, in years past, when it was like the Aginla line, teams would just have to make sure to shut down or contain the Aginla line, and they didn't really need to worry about anything else. And if the odd goal happened from, like, say, Glenn Cross when he was on the second or third line, it's like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. But now it's like, okay, well, if you shut down the first line, now you have to deal with one of the top second lines in the NHL. And if you shut that line down, then you have to deal with one of the better third lines in the NHL. So, like, it just makes it, puts a lot more pressure, and the more pressure you have... The, the more chance of mistakes happening on the opposition and more goals in the net. Here's an interesting idea. I really think that the 3M line is only at its maximum effectiveness at home when we get last change. Because otherwise, teams, we're seeing them already deliberately putting other teams against them. What if you were to run Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich at home and Kachuk, Backlund, let's say Bennett or newly acquired forward on the road? So on the road, you convert it more to a scoring line. At home, you make it your shutdown line when you get last change. It, you could even like manage the game uh, to an extent, like how say like in the first half of the game, if the Flames are tied or trailing a bit, then have the scoring guy with Backland and Kachuk on the road, and then if the Flames are up in the second half of the game, then you switch for Leak in there whenever to just play excellent shutdown defense and then move that guy down in the lineup to one of the other lines so that way... Because I'm assuming that mo in most cases, like other than Nyquist, most of the guys that are offensively talented kind of are terrible defensively. So Yeah, and I'm just looking at uh, lines that line to get in time against, and on the road, teams are deliberately putting like their fourth line against them, so they're not as effective then. Yeah, exactly. But then you're... By doing having them as a trio, then you're allowing, like you're forcing the other team to, because uh, if the Flames are up in the last like third period, say, and it's a playoff game, then the other team has to score, and it's vital to score. So they're not going to be putting their fourth line out there, like they need to score. They're going to shorten their bench and be putting one of their better lines out there. So having that versatility will help yeah no I, I think you're right and i think maybe that's the key to this line is that it can be something to everybody based on what we need and it's the really becomes the backland kachuk line and the right wing spot changes based yeah. on what's needed if you need there. offense throw the offensive guy in there if you need defense throw for a leak in there yeah that might be the way to go honestly for the rest of the season and then you know, especially if we're starting at home, well, then you can 
converted to the 3M line. Yeah, exactly. Another guy I wanted to talk about here while we're talking, we sort of talked about defenseman, a forward, and now I want to go to goal, and we're seeing an amazing year from our starting goaltender, David Riddick. He's had 27 games played, 24 starts, 17 wins, and 4 losses this year. He's got a .920 save percentage um, and a 2.45 goals against. This guy's pretty amazing, and he's only had 16 games started before this year, and we're seeing him really come on this year. And I wanted to find out your thoughts. Do you think he's the next Andrew Hammond where he has one great season, gets paid, and drops off, and people never talk about him again? Or do you think he's trending more towards the Mika Kippersoff road? Uh, When I first started watching him when he was in Stockton, he was just very composed. And, like, you always put... When you're watching, like, you're always putting... uh, more emphasis on the guys that you've drafted because you know them a little more instead of a free agent signing. But he just kept playing very well, and there was no real disturbance to his game. And then when he came to the NHL, when he was the backup for Smith, he played very well, and then he kind of got in over his head because he he wasn't used to the workload when he became the starter, and he struggled for that reason. So I I think that he's trending more to being a guy like Kipper than he is a guy like Hammond, where it's just a one-off. But frankly, I think that he's going to be the starter moving forward, and like I don't see him like right right now for goalie statistics, only John Gibson of the Anaheim Ducks is better than he is. So like he's putting up one hell of a season, frankly, and. I don't see him necessarily repeating that. It'd be awesome if he did, but even if he's just an above-average goaltender, that's fine, especially with this team. And, like, I'm expecting that his contract is not going to be overly expensive because of his lack of experience, but I think that you're probably looking at a a two-and-a-half to three million dollar deal for like say three years he's making eight hundred thousand right now he's on his last year of his deal and he's an rfa i think his agent is going to say you know what this guy took you to the playoffs you got to pay him for that and the rest becomes you know you've always got to look at pain based on what they've done and then on speculation for the future i think he'll get paid because he really took the flames on his back this year and bailed them out from mike smith i don't know if i'd want to go three years though i think i would do a two-year deal with him Say, okay, you've you know done well next year, or you've done well this past year. We'll see how you do next year. And then if he doesn't do well, you've only got one more year to eat. It would be different if he just kind of came out of nowhere. But he's been steady and solid ever since he came to Stockton. So I'm less likely to expect him to regress to the point where like, if he's getting paid, say, $2.5 million, that he'd actually be an anchor. So if it was... Well, I'm not uh, even worried about anger, years. but it, I mean, this team's going to be so close to the cap, too. It might be, hey, we don't want to give a backup guy that much. Yeah. Well, at that point, then... I Frankly, for three years, I'm fine with that. You know, like, even if they have to buy him out for his final season, like, if he's that bad... If, where, if you've got a half-decent goalie, you'll find a buyer. Yeah. You know, you, like, exactly. you might not like, get a lot, there's but you'll nothing... find a buyer. Yeah, like, there's nothing really to worry about. So, like, I personally, three or four years, I, I'd be perfectly fine with that. I think the key is what you said earlier. He hasn't been great. I don't think he's Mika Kiprasov, and I don't think he'll ever be Kiprasov. What I think with a team as good as what we're seeing the Calgary Flames being right now, you don't need that stellar goalie. You don't need the Mika Kiprasov. You need a guy who's an above-average starter. And I think there's a lot of above-average starters in the league who could probably put up similar numbers in the Flames' net this year. I think even Mike Smith could have put up tremendous numbers if he played the way we've seen him play in the past. So I think for Riddick, I don't want to sound like he's not doing good. He is, but I think a lot of it is right place, right time. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why you won't see him getting paid more than like two and a half or three million dollars a season uh, just because of that. But it's one of those things where I'm not really concerned about him, his contract being too much or anything like that. I think the Flames will probably end up next year going with a slightly more veteran backup. Not anybody spectacular, just an okay there's guy. A, we've talked in the past, there's a lot of vets available. 
yeah, uh, just pick one, anyone that you think is right Call and them, comes in at the right offer, price. Whoever will take your money, sign them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like, oh, there's seven of you. Here's a million and a half. Anyone want to sign? Okay, great, awesome. Well, I think too, if you look at the farm, I wouldn't be surprised if Flames kind of give up on Gillies after this year. Um, he's been hurt so much. Like I think for me, I don't trust him as with an NHL load, even as a backup, because of how much he's getting hurt. So I think the Flames. I don't know if his, his contract's uh, not up this year, but I think he's probably your AHL backup next year. I think um, they walk away probably from Mason McDonald at the end of this year. Parsons yeah, isn't quite ready yet. So I think even just looking at where the team's going, let's say they give up on Gillies, they walk away from McDonald. Now you've got, what, Parsons and Schneider? Like I think you, you definitely have to keep... Riddick around if for no other reason than to fill that gap to see what you've got with Parsons. And even he hasn't been all that healthy. Yeah. Oh, I know. And the Flames just kind of, I think, have to be patient with everybody and see. Yeah, like it, especially with the fact that they have nobody else in the pipeline at all. I think it's just going to be important for them just to be patient. Let's see how each of them does. And, like, there's no need, like, even, I'd even bring Mason McDonald back to be, like, the a ECHL backup to Schneider just to see if they can maybe find something in him to salvage him as an asset. You know but, what, though? I don't think there's going to be a lot of demand in McDonald if he doesn't get signed. No. And maybe he goes to an independent ECHL team and is a starter, or he goes overseas. If he starts to look good, I'm sure he could phone him and get him back. Yeah. Um, but I mean, even it's one of those where it's come out of nowhere this year, and I would put right now more faith in him than McDonald. I agree, I agree. And the Flames, I think, uh, I think for this year's draft, it's going to be defensemen and goaltending, frankly, uh, more so than forwards. But uh, we'll see. I, like I, I'm not really overly concerned one way or the other when it comes to what the Flames are doing for the goaltending like it, you just pretty much run with what you got and see how things shake out Cause especially with so many young goaltenders goalies take a while to figure it out like riddick is 26 and he's just now starting to be a, a quality nhl goaltender you just have to be patient well, i don't even know if that's see. quite fair like riddick figured it out in europe and he's now come over and adapted to a north american game it's not like this guy was you know playing terribly in some north american minor league since he was 18 sure enough um but you know nice to see i guess one of those european free agents pay off we've seen some weird ones over the years um and it's nice to see that riddick's paying off for the team and i agree with you i think 2.5 is about what he gets even if you bring in a veteran backup at 1.5 to 2, if Riddick can't do this again next year, if he is a flash in the pan, at least I think he'll be a solid serviceable backup at a solid serviceable backup price then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like if you're paying like $2.5 million for your backup, that's fine. Like that's what Edmonton was paying Koskinen this year, and that's fine. So like it's not... Like, he's kind of turned into the starter because Talbot's been kind of off this year. But, you know, it, that's fine. You know, like, uh, any, frankly, any contract under $4 million, it's like, okay. Like, even if the guy's just, like, say, like, Derek Ryan being the fourth line center, it's like, well, he wins a lot of faceoffs and is good defensively. So, okay, sure, why not? Yeah, there's there's different ways to look at that. I think that I think that's going to change for this team going forward as they oh for a, sure as they really have to tighten their belt next year, trying to get Chucky under cap. I think it's going to take all the money they can muster. Yeah, I think they'll be fine. Before we move on, while we're talking about goalies, your thoughts? Do you think Smitty gets a job next year in the NHL? It depends on how he finishes the year. If he plays well down the stretch and is like Mike Smith that we've been used to probably he enters that veteran backup guy and I wouldn't even be like if he plays well down the stretch and like himself I wouldn't even be shocked if he came back frankly uh but if he continues to waffle between being good and awful then I, I think that that'll be it for him I don't see Smitty as the kind of guy who takes an AHL deal to extend his career. I think he's either NHL or he's done. I agree. And I, I still think, and I've said this before, I still think there's a nagging injury there we don't know about. 
And if that is the case, I think he might be done after this year. Yeah. He's 36. I don't even know if I would want the Flames to bring him back, even at a million, as a 37-year-old backup goaltender. Yeah, it just depends. Like everything. I mean, at some point he's like, going to like, run yeah. out of gas. It's one of those things where, like, if there's like seven or eight different options for veteran backup and he's one of them and he's willing to take the money and none of the others are, are you going to really be that upset if he comes back? Not really. I don't know. Like, that, he wouldn't be. I would rather go with a guy like Gillies to play 10 or 15 games a year than I think I'd want to pay Smith to come back. Yeah, I can see that. I don't think you necessarily need the veteran. Yeah, it's one of those things where you can kind of go one in like six different directions and like each one is okay. Like there's not really any really dumb ideas out there for what to do with the goaltending. Like if you wanted to put Parsons or Gillies in there, that's fine. If you want to sign it, any of a whole litany of backups, that's fine. I agree that I think a veteran backup's the way to go, but I wouldn't pay a premium for the veteran guy. I no. would say, you know what, if we can't get the veteran guy at, a, at the price we want, we call Gillies up or we find somebody else. I mean, there's, you know, tons of... Uh, there's always a European free agent guy like Koskinen this past well, and, year. And every team or, has a John Gillies. I mean, if we don't like yeah. ours, we'll find somebody else's. Yeah, exactly. Just wait until uh, the end of training camp when everybody puts their goalies on waivers, and if there's one that you like, oh, thank you. Yeah, like I think if you're look, if you think that Riddick can do the workload, and uh, to be fair, he's only he's played less than thirty games this year, so we don't know if he can do the, you know, the sixty game workload. But if they think he can, you really, I mean, you can scrimp on that backup position if you want to save some cash. True. So we'll see, but I, I would not be surprised if we end up with Gillies there. And not saying it's my first choice, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way we go. Yep. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about Stockton. Everybody always wants to hear about how Stockton's doing. The highlight of Stockton right now is Curtis Lazar, surprisingly. Um, after 36 games, he has 31 points. We talked about him last week that he thinks he should be in the NHL and putting up those kind of numbers. It looks like he's getting close. He got named to the All Star game um looking at the stockton players really i mean there's not a lot of stars here we've got lazar and right i actually have to say that like the flames i think do have one player in particular that might be a dynamic player for them moving forward and that is the very tiny matthew phillips he started the season with eight or nine games where he had zero points similar to what johnny gaudreau did when he first entered the nhl yeah but that's also adjusting from going from canadian juniors to the ahl yeah but ever since then he's just been absolutely dynamite and one of the top offensive players in the entire ahl and frankly uh, he's the best uh 20 year old forward in the entire ahl so the fact is that he is looking more like a dynamic offensive talent who might actually end up becoming a quality top six forward in the NHL. Currently, thus far this season, he has 23 points in 34 games, which doesn't really stand out as being particularly awesome, but if you take out the 8-9 games, he's basically a point per game since then. And He's at, also playing on the top line with Reichel and Lazar. Yeah, and he's holding his own, and he plays a similar game to Gaudreau where it's very fast and cerebral, and he just knows instinctively where he has to be on the ice, and he's doing a very good job. And like of the young forward prospects, uh, him and Dylan Dubé seem to be the only two that have top six upside in Stockton currently, and... Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Phillips becomes the Flames version of Jake Gensel, just somebody who kind of comes out of nowhere and is a dynamic offensive threat. Well, we've talked about this too. I mean, some players have to fill the bottom two lines, and even if those guys don't make the top six, which I'm not ready to put that on Phillips after, you know, oh, less no. than one pro season, but I think he'll be an NHLer. I don't know if I'm willing to say he'll be a top six, but I can definitely see him being like a third line guy in the NHL. Yeah. Well, I could even see him potentially being that right winger for the Kachuk backland line. So it 
It's possible. I think, I think by the time Phillips is ready, Backlund and even Kachuk, I mean, Kachuk will probably be at his peak. Backlund will be going down just based on their age. I'm not sure that's going to be the dynamic line it will be by the time Phillips is ready. Yeah. Well, it just depends on when Phillips forces his way on the team, and I think that he is going to end up forcing his way into the organization onto the NHL team. And even Dubé, it's interesting, this past weekend, played on the third line. He was behind Grayovac as a center, playing a line with Fu and Lomberg as the third line there. So, um, I don't know, Dubé, again, struggling a bit this year to adjust to that pro game. Yeah, and that's typical of most younger players, especially because he's been up and down from the NHL. It's hard to get into a really good rhythm because of that. Well, looking at who is doing well, uh, as we mentioned, Curtis Lazar, 31 points. Kirby Reichel, 31 points. This is a guy, I don't know about you, I kind of expected to put up a lot of points considering how long he's been around the pro game. Yeah, and frankly, like if Reichel was fast or faster, he'd probably be a top six forward in the NHL. It's just that he's just so slow that he's always behind the play. Um, and then we've got Tyler Grailvac with 29 points, Alan Quine at 28, Buddy Robinson at 25, like you said, Phillips at 23, and one of their defensemen who's not even a Flames prospect, Rob Hamilton with 20 points on defense. And even below him is Fu, Godden, Mongepani. I mean, guys that aren't around there anymore, Shillington. Um, but, yeah, it's it's good. I guess it's the guys I expected based on their veteran nature to be at the top who are at the top which is good to see yeah for sure looking at the goalie stats a little more of a mess though the goalie with the most games this year is john gillies 24 games um he's at 85 goals against his goals against average is 4.07 and he's had five wins 11 losses and three overtime losses like that's not the stats line you want to be putting up for a guy who's trying to push for an NHL job. To be fair to John Gillies, he's more of a blocking style goaltender, and the change in equipment, I think, has hit him a little more significantly than it would have otherwise, and like, like you, you we're seeing like with Mike Smith, how he's struggled with allowing bad goals that he would have normally just absorbed into himself, and I think that uh, Gillies is having much the same problem in that he's having to learn how to make saves versus having pucks hit him. And I, frankly, I wouldn't write him off yet just because of the fact that it does take a while to adjust, and if he can bounce back next year, he should be fine. It's just... I'm not necessarily writing him off because of his stats. My big thing is he's just... He's far too hurt. He's played, what, four pro seasons and been hurt for most of two of them? Yeah. Like, to me, that's the reason I start to write this guy off is I don't think he's reliable enough to look at as an NHL goaltender. Well, actually, he's only just hurt the one year um, in 15-16. He's hurt this year. Well, yeah, but not, like, the same kind of injury. Like, it, it was just a short-term injury, so not the same... Like where he missed and most then, of the year. And then a lot of people asked about Tyler Parsons. Tyler Parsons has played nine games, uh, 35 goals against, 4.70 goals against average. He has five wins, three losses, um, and an 87% save percentage. Parsons, we talked about him last year when he was in the ECHL. He's still a guy who, again, is figuring out the pro game. I think when I've watched Parsons a few times this year, to me, he seems like he's too good for the ECHL. But not quite where he needs to be for the AHL. He's in this weird middle ground. Yeah, I agree. And I think he'll get it together, like you said. It's going to take time, but there's no real place to put him to work that out. I don't. No, think. and it's kind of just frustrating because he's not playing very well. Like, frankly, like the all of the Flames goalies throughout the system like mason mcdonald his stats in the echl aren't too horrible that he's got a 261 goals against and 907 save percentage but he's only played 12 games and schneider has been kind of up and down so like it's weird though because you and i thought schneider would be the worst goalie this year like we were even questioning why you know bring the guy pro and he's looking like the best goaltender not wearing a flaming seam yeah i know uh, goalies are always bizarre so, 
it, you just have to wait and see. Like it, it's so tough. Uh, one other player I want to mention. It's an NCAA prospect. Our sixth round pick last year, YouTube sensation Matthias Emilio Pedersen. Uh, one of the knocks on him heading into his draft year was that he was physically immature. Uh, he's five foot ten, one hundred and seventy pounds, but he was pushed off the puck very easily, and he had a hard time developing his offensive talent because of that. But uh, since going to the NCAA, he's with one of the better trainers in the NCAA, and that. The problem uh, has been rectified, and he's a very enthusiastic learner of the game and trying to improve himself, and he's put a lot of work ethic in. And he has 20 points in 20 NCAA games, which is what remarkable considering he's a freshman. Yeah, and as much as, you know, we've talked about this before, that as much as the Flames haven't had those top picks, they've done really well with some of their lower picks in the last couple of years. Yeah, and that's why, like, for years when it came to the draft, I've always been advocating instead of taking, like, the physical guy who, if he turns out, is going to be a fourth-line guy, throw some darts at the... You mean the Daryl Sutter method of yeah, drafting? Yeah, like the Kanzigs and Hunter Smiths of the world. Instead... You're big and you're from Western Canada. Get over yeah, here. Yeah, like, throw some draft picks that some guys that have issues but are very talented it, that way if they do figure it out you have somebody actually worth having around and Pedersen seems to have figured certain things out to the point where he's raised his value for sure and might even become an NHL or down the road because of it I always remind people, Johnny Goudreau, we drafted in the fourth round, and our captain, we didn't even draft. Yeah, and TJ Brody was a forward until his draft year and fell to the fourth round because of it, and look at how he turned out. So, you know, it's one of those things that, like, the more that you can throw picks at high-quality offensive players, the more that they might actually turn out. Like, look at Adam Fox. We were able to make a huge trade that improved the organization getting Lindholm and Hannafin for Hamilton, Furland, and Fox. And if it wasn't for Fox being undersized but extremely talented, the Flames wouldn't have had that chip to use, even though he was a third-round pick. And just focusing more on offensively talented guys in the draft always seems to make more sense just because if they do turn out, it having a good second or first line player is always more important than some filler fourth line guy. Or like you said, somebody we can include in a trade to get something we need. Exactly. Um, so just before we wrap up Stockton here, right now they are uh, second last in the Pacific Division behind with only Ontario behind them. They have 16 wins, 18 losses, three overtime losses for a total of 35 points. So not looking too great this year. I mean, they don't have a lot of great players there. And that also makes them third last in the league. So I guess the pros are the Flames are going to have a bunch of guys they can call it for a playoff run. Yeah, the Stockton, it's understandable. Like The Flames, because they're a rebuilding team for the past few years, most of the good players went straight to Calgary. Well, and anybody they did have that was good. Like, you know, hey, they had Mangiapane, he's here. They had um, Shillington, he's here. They had Anderson, he's here. Like, it's this weird cycle when your team is good because you want to call these guys up, but then your farm team doesn't have them. Yeah, and then the farm team sucks accordingly. So, you know, like, I, I also can't really put too much fault on Gillies or Parsons, uh, frankly, for their stats as well because you look at the Flames uh, farm team's defense core and – Boy, is that horrid. For sure. Well, it's like looking at a goaltender playing for a poor NHL team. So you yeah. have a good goalie behind a bad defense. Yeah. Well, it's just like Patrick Wall when he was in juniors, his goals against average was over eight because his team was garbage. So, <laughs> so Matt, before we get out of here, um, ask for fan questions this week, as we always do on social media. If you want to be part of shaping the show and what you hear, check us out on Mondays, the day we record on Facebook or Twitter. And we always generally put out a call asking, hey, what do you guys want us to talk about? And friend of the show, Kevin Olenek, at Kev Ol on Twitter, asked, what's 
the most important acquisition? If you could only make one trade, say, between now and trade deadline, do you think the Flames should go for a forward, a defenseman, or a goalie? I'm going to go forward, believe it or not. Yeah, why? Uh, the Flames have, frankly, 10 forwards that are top-notch, where like they're good for the roles that they're in. And being able to push one of them down a bit, I think would help to be able to have the team roll four lines thoroughly through the playoffs where no matter what, you're going to be facing a hard line to play against. And just that amount of depth, I think, would wear down teams over a seven-game series. And defense would be a very close second, but it's not... Like, the caliber of guy that you're needing for the third-pairing left defense, like, that's not... He's not going to make a real difference in a playoff series. No, like, you're not... It's not that important. Like, it's important, but it's not the end of the world if you you run with Shillington and Valimaki as your third-pairing guy. So, I... I think that having the ability just to have the forward group just demolish the other team and just roll them over, you know, where you can just go line one, line two, line three, line four, line one, two, three, four, and just keep going at them. Like, th- you're not going to give the other team any rest. And with the how it's currently made up, I think that you either have to shorten the bench or you have to use like do things a little weirdly and having that ability just to roll things over I think is more important for me I think if I I think with Stone coming back soon I'm not too worried about the defense I think we can make do with what we've got um, especially because it's not a top guy I mean Geo's looking good Brody's looking good Hannafin's looking good Hamnick's looking good if one of those guys wasn't looking good I'd be more worried about the defense I think to get a top six forward is going to be a price that I don't want to pay. So for me, if they're going to make one move, I want them to make a goalie move. Even if Mike Smith comes back, he's 37 and we don't have much other option. If he can't do it, or if he gets hurt or, uh, you know, um, knock on wood, David Riddick gets hurt. I'm not comfortable with Smitty and Parsons, Gillies, whoever. So I'd like them to go get sort of a third goalie they can carry just as an insurance policy if it's one of those. But Honestly, I think if I was the Flames, I'd stand pat this year. For me, I'd like, frankly, I'd like to see them go and get all three, if possible. As long as they don't the, have the assets to get all three. Oh yeah, they do. You just have, I think so without decimating the farm. Well, giving up every well, future guy we've got. Well, frankly, like a defenseman of the caliber that you're looking at, like that's a third or a fourth round pick. So like that's not, it's something, but not overly expensive a goaltender especially a backup for a bit like you're not needing somebody who's awesome like if you're going that route you could even get by with like a variation of like Hutchinson who was just traded for a sixth or you know like there's plenty of guys that you can get that are just okay and I think that's all that you frankly need it, like a, a guy like Anton Hudobin or somebody of that caliber where it's just you just need a guy who's okay and uh, I think we can definitely do it without giving up much from the roster but as we talked about our farm team looks poor right now and I don't want to go giving away all our picks either because otherwise you know when we need to replace some of these guys there's gonna be nobody to do it with yeah well that's where the flames need to get creative and sign a bunch of free agents from overseas or the NCAA and especially with the Flames being such a good team and them showing a willingness to have guys step into the NHL I think that the Flames are going to quickly become a destination for any of the UFA college guys that are wanting to sign in the NHL especially like if you're a goaltender like you're just looking at oh well the only guy I have to really compete with is Riddick so like that Matt Gaeta guy that was at the development camp in July, you know, he'll probably you know like if he's looking around, he'd probably go, "Hey, Calgary seems like a really good idea because of the fact that they don't have anybody else." So, you know, Calgary has that option, especially due to the fact that you'd look at Stockton and you know, like really, what's your competition? So, you know, a lot of 
the Flames can say that, you know, if you play well, you're going to get a shot because they've basically given everybody a shot if they're doing okay. So I think that's going to be the main way that the Flames restock their farm system. So, like, if it comes to you... I think you're overestimating the value of or the number of valuable free agents out there. You only need a couple. You know, like, if you get anybody who's even an NHL-ish player that you can throw out there on the fourth line. Hey, awesome. Like, yeah, I mean, we saw them bring in, you know, a lot Yashin Ali's this year. He wanted to go home. Like, I think that there's so many variables there that to keep that rolling, if you're giving away all your draft picks, it's going to be tough. Well, the Flames, luckily, are in a position where, like, frankly, if they just stood pat, even with re-signing Kachuk and Bennett, uh, th- like they don't need to sh- really shed any money, so like it, with the cap going up to like eighty three million dollars and Smith's contract expiring, if they just throw one of the kids as the backup, th- they can give Kachuk seven and a half, Bennett two and a half, and like they can keep the same team. So like it's like they're not desperate for making changes. So like if they did sacrifice draft picks this year to try and win the Stanley Cup, but it's like, it, if you're going to do it, this would be the year to do it. Uh, moving forward, not so much. Like, you'll need to start replacing guys, but for right now, you can get away with it. Well, we'll see what happens going down the stretch. Who knows? They might even do something we haven't expected. I mean, Tree often surprises us, so we'll see what he comes up with. But um, before we get to our predictions for the week, We want to remind you guys that the 28th is coming up, and the 28th is going to be a show we do where we only have one game to talk about. That's when the Flames are in the bye week. They have nine days off there. So we want you guys to be the star of the show that week. Um, We have on our website at firesidechat.ca, we'll also put it out on Facebook and Twitter, a link. If you want to talk to us, you can fill that out. If you want to come on the show, we'll have an ability to take calls. They'll be pre-screened. So let us know what you want to talk about. We'll get in touch with you, get you all set up. If you want us to read a message from you, we can definitely do that as well. Just fill out the form. Or if you want to leave us a voicemail, if you can't be with us, uh, phone us at area code 587-200-7176. Leave us a voicemail. We'll play that on the show. But we really want this to be you guys having a say about the Flames. Maybe you want to read about what Matt and I were saying about free agents. Um, you know, maybe you have something else to talk about. Maybe it's not even this year's team. It could be your favorite Flames memory. It could be, um, you know, your anything best experience as a Flames fan. But talk to us. Let us know what you guys want to talk about. We want to open the show to you. So firesidechat.ca is where you'll see the link to that. And we hope to talk to you guys on the 28th. Um, but Matt, until then, we've got three games to talk about, you and I. Two at home, one quick road trip up to Edmonton. The Flames on Wednesday play against the Buffalo Sabres at home, 7.30 start time. Friday night's a Detroit game, 7 o'clock start time, and then Saturday night in Edmonton. If you want to go to any of those games, the Dome is such a fun place to be this year. With the Flames doing well, it's so much fun in there. So get your tickets. Um, there's still tickets available. You can go to seatgiant.ca. Great price for those tickets, and I'd even say if you haven't been to Edmonton yet, take a trip up there on Saturday. Their new arena is cool. You should go see it. Uh, Still some good prices. Nobody wants to go see the Oilers play, so good prices for those. (laughs) Seatgiant.ca. Use the promo code FIRESIDE when you buy. uh, Now you you know why the Oilers are desperate to make the playoffs, because they know that if they miss... Like, everybody's going to be like, yeah, screw this team. We'll trade you your new rink for somebody. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, there's. I'm looking at the site right now, seatgiant.ca. There's tons of tickets for the Oilers-Flames game. Um, so, if you know, it's a quick trip up. It's a Saturday. You could still make it back in time for, you know, be in your own bed that night or stay overnight and come back Sunday morning. But um, definitely check it out. Go to the seatgiant.ca. Use our code FIRESIDE. Buy some tickets for those games. You want to be part of the energy this year. It's so much fun in the Dome. So, Matt, three games. What are you expecting? Uh it depends on what team the Flames decide to be. If they decide to be the inconsistent team, I think they drop one or two of them. If they're playing the way they should be, they should smoke all three of them. And I, I'm i going to go with the latter just because I have confidence that they will ha- get their act together and start playing more disciplined 
heading into the break, and I think that they're just going to ca- carry on and beat all three of them. Yeah, I locked in my prediction at 2 p.m. today. I think that we're going to get another sweep week, and I think that'll be, what, seven, eight, eight. eight games in a row. And I think as much as we're looking ahead, but that Carolina game here against the old team of Peters, I think they better win that one. Like, Yeah. You know, that's, so I think we can go into this. I think, oh, I think Peters is going to be like, guys – Get the two effing points. Whoever, Just whoever do doesn't the... score is skating laps tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. If you guys allow a goal against or, you know, make really bad mistakes, you're going to get it the next you day. You think you're going to Mexico <laughs> for the break? If you don't score, you're doing laps here for nine days. Yeah. <laughs> so We're going to lock you in here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting three wins. I think there'll be a fun three wins. I'll be at the Buffalo game. Um, I think it's... I mean, they're not great teams the Flames are playing, and I think we can really... No, Buffalo was really good to start the year, but they've kind of fallen off the face of the earth. Detroit's horrible, and Edmonton's, like, got two players that are actually good. So, you know, <laughs> it, as long as you contain McDavid, you you should get two points. Even if you can't contain McDavid the way this team's playing, you can probably just outscore them. Like, yeah, true even enough. If, even if, not saying I want to do that, but even if McDavid sort of gets a hat trick you know it's like okay yeah good your boy got a hat trick like, we have we'll, so many, we'll just score seven on you <laughs> we have so many more weapons that even if we can't contain mcdavid we should be able to outscore them because we've got you know three scoring lines well the thing is that the oilers since the 80s haven't figured out that you actually need to have depth with your talent and like even if you look back to the 90s like they had a few good players like wait and garen and all that but they never surrounded them with anybody that could actually play. And back in the eighties, they had like six hall of famers basically. So, you know, you could kind of get away with having a couple of mediocre guys. Cause those guys were so good, but you know, McDavid's no Gretzky. <laughs> yeah. No, I so. don't think there will ever be another Gretzky. And even Gretzky, remember Gretzky didn't do it by himself. Like you said, he had a great team no. around him. And I think that's what a lot of people forget. Yeah, well, they got rid of Gretzky in 88, eight, and then they proceeded to win the Stanley Cup in 90 because the rest of their team was still that good. So, you know, it's the Oilers, like, their main problem has been that, oh, well, we have these four first overall guys, and then they surround them with crap, and they have no money to spend because they... You know, like, oh, Milan Lucic, he's awesome. Yeah, not really. We won't spend too much time talking to Oilers, but I have a funny feeling the season's over, what, April 6th? I think April 7th. If you're in the front office or the coaching staff, you're out of a job. I think they're just going to clean yeah. the house this year. Yeah, frankly, like if it was me, the, the GM's gone, the coach is gone, all the scouts are gone, everybody in management is gone. Like, just everybody. If you don't hold a hockey stick for a living, you're out of a job. Yeah, pretty much. And even then, <laughs> some of them too. Well, at that point, there's nobody to trade them, so they'll last for a little bit of time. Yeah, true enough. So, Matt, we'll talk... Hey, the janitor just traded Connor McDavid. <laughs> what we want you to do, Bill, the janitor, is reach into this bin and pick out a name. Whoever's name you pick out is going to Boston. <laughs> or you put your Xbox on auto sim for the summer, and that's how you manage the team. Yeah, <laughs> awesome way to run a hockey team. Yeah, Probably go. didn't prove it. <laughs> I, I can just see them sitting at the draft table. It's time to go up, and their Xbox freezes. It's like we're on the clock. Why'd you freeze on us? <laughs> God damn it! Now what? <laughs> That's right. Some guy just peering over. What does the... TSN say? <laughs> Why don't we just let Mackenzie make the pick? Hey Bob, we're, here's fifty bucks. Make our pick for us. That's right. So, <laughs> we have no GM, but yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, Matt, I will talk to you next week. Enjoy this three-week game for the Flames, and hopefully it'll be some exciting Flames hockey. Well, hopefully the Flames just keep winning, so that way those pesky Sharks and Vegas Golden Knights can just kind of go away. Yeah, I think they really need to put up some more points to go into the break with a bit of a cushion. Yeah, well, until those guys, like, frankly, like, every game now is a must-win until Vegas and San Jose cool down. And it sounds stupid, saying that but in terms of the flames fortune in the playoffs it's absolutely vital that they win the division just so they don't have to play those both of those teams 
And, you know, especially because they're both dangerous. You don't want to have to be forced to play both of them. So it's a must win until either of those teams start to slide and regress. Then you can ease up a bit. Well, enjoy this week, and we'll talk to you next Monday, man. Take it easy, everybody, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.